during my stay in England and training with Sykes and other British officers, I encountered a Finn who had killed over a dozen Russian sentries during the Russian Finnish War, which was taking had taken place just prior to the beginning of World War II. This Finn had used the traditional Finnish puka knife, which was a single edge knife. He stated that originally he would use he used a shorter blade knife than a six inch blade and found it to be wanting in his particular situation, which was this. The Russians and the Finns were fighting in the dead of winter, heavy snow, freezing conditions, and the sentries encountered were heavily bundled up with bulky clothing and harness, heavy overcoats, etc. The Finn would dress himself in a white coverall type garment and creep through the snow and kill the Russian sentries one at a time on isolated sentry post duty. The Finn stated that after the first three or four times with his shorter blade knife, he began to realize that due to the heavy clothing that was being worn that his knife blade wasn't long enough. And he had to repeat himself a number of times when he was sticking the various sentries uh, in the kidney in the back and then cutting their throats, etc. So he finally secured a longer blade, five inch puka knife. And this was the one which he had success in using for the rest of his tour of duty. This is the only known instance that I have of any criteria ever being set for the length of a knife blade. However, the other criteria that's important is the fact that the overall length of the knife, blade and handle, has to be comfortable to carry. And generally speaking, the limitation is about 12 inches in this case. This is knife and handle in the scabbard. Anything longer than that becomes overly cumbersome and is not uh, the best tactical length to carry. With further regard to blades, it is my contention that all combat blades, in fact all of a combat knife, should be dull and finish. In the case of the Applegate Fairburn, this is a bead blast finish put into the stainless steel. At present day there are a number of coatings that could be finished or furnished to do the same purpose as dulling the blade and also protecting it from the elements. I am not in favor of what I would call the Christmas tree model. That would be any knife that as a shiny hilt, cross piece, or shiny blade. These knives may look good over the counter and when you're waving them around in the air and practice and whatnot, but they are not practical and they reflect too much light for combat duty. The other point about the blades should be mentioned is this, the combat blade of best type is the one with a hollow grind. 
this grind enables a sharper blade to be finished and also enables the blade to be resharpened better and is generally superior to any of the other grinds, flat grinds and others that are employed by different knife manufacturers. The smatchet is another weapon which had its origins in World War II with which I was closely associated along with W. E. Fairburn. The first smatchet that I ever saw was the smatchet that Fairburn brought with him from England to the States in 1942. And this weapon was featured in Fairbairn's book, Get Tough, published the same year. Going to England later to trade with Sykes, British commandos, and other units of the Special Operations Executive, the SOE, I was interested in following up on the Smatchet, but strangely enough, I had never, I had never encountered a spatchet and never was able to even encounter anyone other than some of Fairburn's old instructors who had ever seen or even owned one. The origin of the spatchet is still unknown, but believed to have come out of British ordnance due to the efforts of some unknown designer. In all probability, the smatchet and the unique blade shape originated back in the ancient Celtic times when a bladed weapon known as a cled was used by the Welsh and Celtic tribes. In 1917, the British used at the Battle of Messine Ridge, the Welsh cled as it was then known. These weapons were used in close quarter fighting and trench warfare and were special issue and were paid for by the colonel of the regiment involved in the, in the fighting that took place there. But probably this is where the Smatchet's original design originated that later came into being as the OSS Smatchet. The British Smatchet, such as Fairburn had and a few others, is a relatively rare collector's item and differs very little from the OSS production of about 10,000 smatchets in World War II, which undoubtedly were copied from Fairburn's own weapon. These smatchets were unmarked as to maker, origin, or any other information regarding its origin or source and were destined to be used in the Far East. Rumor has it that most all of the OSS matches were shipped via submarine to the Far East and never reached their destination. So again, the OSS matches is in its original state a, a, a rare weapon also. It was a fascinating weapon and one that intrigued me greatly. And when I came back from Europe and talked to Fairburn about it, we decided that along with the Applegate Fairburn combat knife, it might be a good knife to explore for 
as a combination combat and utility weapon for future mass production for U.S. and Allied troops. The first smatchet that we made was a double-edged smatchet which was made in the OSS machine shop, this being the first prototype. I would like to point out that the original smatchet from British, British origin was sharp only on one edge. And was obviously designed more as a utility weapon than a weapon. It was my thoughts, Fairmer's in mind, that if we could make this a double-edged weapon, it would be a superior close-quarter fighting weapon and also could be used in place of machete as a great utility knife and also in place of the well-known machete in the heavy jungle areas. The Smatchet prototype remained in my storage with my other artifacts and weapons for a good number of years. And it wasn't until 1988 that I decided that possibly it might be a good weapon to develop for the American market and possibly fighting men throughout the world. I turned to Bill Harsey, my custom knife maker for the Applegate Fairburn fighting knife, and he produced for me his first custom smatchet. This happens to be smatchet number one. It is considerably improved in de design in the handle. The weight is forward as, as it should be. For the smatch, it should be a chopping instrument. And this model is still being custom made by Harsey for special collectors. However, the price was much too high for an issue knife or a knife for general purchase by the public. We designed, or I might say redesigned, the Smatchet for mass production and an initial run of 500 knives or Smatchets was made accordingly. The Buck Smatchet was composed of a laser cut blank of steel and two slabs of the grip, one on each side. This made production simple and very fast and cut the cost greatly. This match it retailed for less than $200. It is now, unfortunately, a collector's item, as no further production has been made of this weapon that has been in this price range. The Smatchet was, without doubt, the most fearsome and best close quarter fighting weapon existent of the bladed edge type. It enables the thrust, cut, slash, rip, and do all of the close quarter things that are necessary in, in a melee and close quarter combat situation where edge weapons are the premier type of deadly piece employed. For the utility purposes, the knife will substitute for a machete and will also substitute for a shovel, digging a foxhole, or various other things that are of utility nature. One of the unique features of the knife 
is the hole in the blade on this side. This hole enables the user to determine which edge he is using by sight and day or by feel at night. This enables him, for instance, to, when using it as a utility knife, to keep one edge razor sharp for slicing bacon, cutting, cutting other articles around camp, other food articles, other other items of this nature and utilizing the other edge for chopping. Having, having a means of being able to distinguish one edge from the other is also useful because of sharpening it's easy to distinguish which, which edge is going to be needed to, for, for uh, the most purposes and indicate by means of the whole which edge that might be accordingly in its, in its uh, working capacity. It is not nearly as cumbersome as it might appear and can be easily carried on the belt or parachute harness in other ways without too much difficulty by most troops or users. The weight of the spatchet, the buck spatchet, is one pound eight ounce. The blade length is ten inches. <coughs> the width, the widest point is three. Blade thickness is three sixteenths of an inch. And the blade is flat ground with a special emphasis on a very heavy steel point. The handle is made of Lexan, the polycarbonate material, and is practically indestructible. One thing of particular interest with the Buck spatchet is the thong and its design. It is not advisable with any kind of machete or other heavy blade that's used for chopping to carry it with the thong around the wrist in this manner. What needs to be done is to hook the thumb in the thong, wrap, wrap, the blade, wrap the thong around the wrist and grasp the blade in this manner. When this knot is tied sufficiently to fit the individual hand, the blade is, is locked in. At the same time, if it's desirable to let go of the blade, it'll come off the hand in this manner. When the, when the wrist is, is in this manner is used, the thong is this, this manner around the wrist. Sometimes in chopping, the blade will go from the hand and can catch and come around and hit the, hit the user on the thigh or otherwise and give a dangerous cut. This is particularly true with a machete type weapons that are, that are now used. The Applegate Fairburn fighting knife. It should be held in a cross palm grip in this manner, with the thumb and forefinger as, as indicated. It should not be held like this, the ice pick grip, or it should not be held like this, which is also similar to as you would hold a hammer handle. If the Applegate Fairburn knife is held properly in this manner, you will be able to maneuver it forehand, backhand, 
by barely turning over the wrist. Forehand, backhand. In this form, you are able to thrust, to slash in either direction and from either side. And this is the basic manner in which any two-handed fighting knife should be held. Even the bayonet as fits the M1 carbine can be used in this proper manner. Cut, slash, overhand, backhand, thrust, rip, etc. The only difficulty with the bayonet in use in this banner is the fact that the edge is not double all the way back, it is not double edged, and of course the handle is cumbersome and not designed as is the Applegate Fairburn for swift combat maneuverability. We have a Randall number one. The Randall number one can also be used in the same manner. However, the user is handicapped by the fact that the blade is not sharpened on one side and the grip is not entirely designed for extreme maneuverability. Actually, the Randall number one is not a pure fighting knife, but was designed as a combination fighting and utility knife and was so used during the World War II period. Here we have the M9 Frobus III bayonet and knife as designed to fit on the current AR-16A2 rifle. This knife has no relation to being a, fi a fighting knife and basically is really designed for field utility use and not for fighting purposes. However, like any other knife, if used with the edge in the proper position, it can be used to cut and also can be used to thrust. However, what we are after in the ideal pure fighting knife is a knife similar to the Applegate Fairburn exclusively designed for cutting, slashing, thrusting, and ripping, and so balanced in the handle, which is weighted, that it lends itself to easy and fast maneuverability in a combat situation. Notice how the wrist turns to enable the knife to cut with one edge or the other. Backhand, forehand, just like in tennis. Thrusting, slashing, ripping. This knife is truly the all-around type of design so necessary if you are interested in a knife designed purely for fighting purposes and secondarily for utility purposes. And most knives in the field today are not designed with this purpose in mind. Proper stance for the use of a pure fighting knife is to have the knife to the rear and be in an aggressive forward crouch in this manner. In this particular stance, you are able to advance with one foot and slash, reduce, advance here, slash, backhand, forehand, 
or do whatever maneuver you need to do with the greatest facility because of the design of the knife and the way in which it is held. Again, this is the proper fighting knife stance. The left hand will be used to maintain balance, to offer a distraction to the opponent, to throw a handful of dirt, dust, or grime into his eyes, or whatever other means that you need, or perhaps even in the case of an opponent's blade to offer a protection while you are yourself e executing a thrust or a slash. It should be stated here that cases of one-on-one -on -one knife fighting and dueling are extremely rare. Generally speaking, the knife is used in a very rapid manner and usually only by one party and before the incident is over the one party, the injured party, the wounded party has not even been aware that the knife has been employed against him if everything else is equal. It is a rapid means of fighting, a rapid means of closing with the enemy and any knife fighter within a distance of five to ten feet from, a, from an individual is extremely dangerous. These are vulnerable points for use in attacking another visual with a knife. And they are not necessarily fatal points, but they are disabling. And it's really up to the knife fighter after he has disabled his, appoint, his opponent by using any of these particular methods to whether or not he wants to go ahead and finish off his opponent or walk away from him. One is the inside of the wrist. Just hold your hand out here. That cuts all the wrist tendons. The other one is cutting across there. That cuts the tendons on the top of the hand. Another one is this bicep, right there, or here. Inasmuch as the person will probably have his arm out in trying to defend himself, these are easily approached points. The forearm, the forearm, is not a vulnerable point, but this bicep muscle here is a vulnerable point. This, the brow, is a vulnerable point. Any heavy wound across the top of the brow will cause heavy bleeding and blind the opponent in the eyes and make him help, help, helpless until the bleeding is stopped. With regard to other points that are not only vulnerable but fatal, obviously those points that are around the throat and the neck are the ones that need to be protected most from, from any kind of a knife thrust here, here, or here. A thrust to the belly, thrust in, rip coming out, or a slash across here or here will generally end the fight very fast. The object of any person who is trying to defend himself against a determined knife fighter would generally be that he will instinctively bend over and suck in his guts. Psychologically, this point here is one that he seems to want to protect the most and will use his hands out in front of him to, to do as best he can to protect himself. But use the arms, use the, use the top of the head for the less deadly thrusts. The slash is here, here, and here. The slash across here, the thrust in here with the rip coming out are all deadly points in knife fighting that need to be considered depending on the situation at hand. Thrust into the kidney area on either side, 
thrusting in and ripping coming out will generally be fatal within a matter of seconds. Thrusts here or slices here also are vulnerable. Again, this, this is the vulnerable spot, cutting these bicep muscles. To the legs, cut on the inside of the leg muscles, front and back. Hamstring, across the tendons. Turn around, Jesse. The same here, thrust in, slash out, thrust in, slash out. And of course, don't forget the family jewel plan always to be the aggressor and try to take advantage of every type of surprise and what you can. And one of the first things to remember is that you, not only in combination with the attack with a knife or with a club or with a gun for that matter, one of the first things that you should try to do is to destroy the mental balance of the victim. Now this can be done in many ways. For instance, if I am taking advantage of the element of surprise and this is my would-be victim, I can, yeah, and it's over. I've, I've, I've given a yell, I've better given a battle cry, I've given a scheme, I've stuck him in the guts and ripped it out and his guts are on the floor and that's it. There are no gentlemen in close combat situations. Use the element of surprise. Use a yell, a scream. Attack with a scream, attack with a yell. Use a handful of sand, use a handful of dirt, use a handful of coins out of your pocket, throw them in your, your, your opponent's face. Kick him and, and stuck him at the same time. Whatever it is, use the element of destroying his mental balance. And you've got his mind on something entirely different from what's happening to him. And, and by the time it's through, it'll be a matter of a half a second. It'll be all over, particularly if it's with a knife or a handgun at close quarters. Trust flash. That's what you want to do. Don't waste any motion. For every forward motion, make, make, make the thrust going in, the thrust, and then rip coming out, or vice versa. Now that simulate down toward the lower leg there, just like with some guy's leg and you're, you're gonna, gonna dive on one leg and rip his leg on the inside, see? Just go in and, yeah, that's right. 